Welcome. Wow, this is a very good turnout. I think it's a fascinating topic, and we have some great speakers here. We're going to start the session with a quick introduction to the panelists, literally names and titles, <laughs> and then um, a quick introduction to blockchain. Uh, the session is about emerging technology, but that seems to be the pillar of um, the discussion. So we're going to do a quick 101, quick being about five, six, seven minutes. And then we'll get into real discussions with the panelists, followed by a case study exercise where we just start a certain element towards mapping out a blockchain for you, for those that haven't actually worked in the field. It's a way to get you thinking in and around the systems planning that we actually do in the space. And then we're going to talk about the challenges and the opportunities um, that we're facing here and how that relates to sustainable land use and business model. So uh, first, I will introduce myself. <laughs> um, Catherine Foster, former Canadian diplomat turned innovation and development lead for the EU's Climate Kick, uh, where I was for four years, leading up 900 startups and hundreds of innovation projects across Europe. I moved here eight months ago uh, for a posting at the World Bank, my husband's posting, not mine, uh, and I have been uh, working on building out uh, blockchain labs for open collaboration in Copenhagen, but I'm now an advisor to the World Bank on its blockchain and carbon markets uh, use case and pilot. But um, our speakers are why we're here, and uh, we have with us Anshal Anand, the Land Administration Specialist from the World Bank. Todd Miller, the VPU business, uh, Vice President of the U.S. Business Development from Away, who's actually sponsored the session, so thank you. And Frank Pichel, who is the Interim CEO and Chief Program Officer of the Cadasta Foundation. So uh, welcome and thank you for sponsoring the session. So first, the introduction to blockchain. Bear with me and jump in if I, I go astray. Um, it's, blockchain is basically a decentralized, distributed, and public, more or less, digital ledger that is used to record data transactions across many computers so that the record cannot be altered retroactively without the alteration of all the subsequent records and without altering across all the nodes. So that means, basically, instead of going through a centralized system, we go across a network. Blockchain was introduced in a 2008 paper, uh, Bitcoin Peer-to-Peer -peer Electronic Cash System, by Satoshi Nakamoto, which is a pseudonym, as you've probably heard. It's an alternative to the modern financial system. Bitcoin was a peer-to-peer -peer digital currency that does not need to go through a trusted third party for the asset to be transferred. So instead of going through central, it's distributed. The network, Bitcoin network, actually began in January 2009. And since then, we've actually augmented enough that we can actually send anything that can be put on a digital file through blockchain technology. Blockchain allows different parties that do not know each other or do not trust each other, or maybe trust each other but may not trust everyone else in the network, to share information without requiring a central administrator, as we said. Transactions are processed by a network of users acting as a consensus mechanism so that everyone is creating the same shared system of record simultaneously. So that means that everyone in this room, if you were part of the network, your computer or server on the blockchain network hosts that network. And each of your machines is a continually list, con continually lists those growing records which are enforced by cryptography. In order to change one, I would have to break into all of your systems and shift it. The records are not stored in that centralized server. And because they're distributed, this, what does that mean? It means that everything is recorded in blocks, which are essentially the containers holding the records of some or all of the most recent transaction in the network around 500 per block. And each is linked to the next block through something called a hash, which is just a long string of numbers and letters, which includes the previous hash and gets recorded. And the transactions are compiled, timestamped, and encrypted into these hashes. And that's basically 
how the system evolves. You would have to change the hash hashes of all the copies on that blockchain of all the different computers and servers that use it simultaneously. And everything that comes thereafter would be corrupted. That is why blockchain is considered to be immutable and unchangeable. Now, what this means boiled down is that there are three core components that allow for the exchange of assets among participants. There's a digital ledger, there's cryptography, and a distributed network. And that means that you have a globally accessible ledger, you have public and private keys so you can set the security, and you have the storage on that distributed network. It's peer-to-peer -peer, and you can choose how big or who is involved in that network. And so this means that you can reduce friction, you can lower risks, you can lower costs, you can increase in efficiencies once the blockchain is up and running, that is. There are many different blockchain applications on the market right now. Everyone's heard of Bitcoin, but there's actually over 90. And they operate under different rules and different permissions. Some of these people talk about public or private or semi-private, on-chain, off-chain, but it's all about permissions. Chains are like, like Bitcoin are permissionless, meaning that anybody with a computer can view and access the blockchain. Permission systems allow certain users to do certain things on the blockchain, but it's not open to everyone. So we could create our own system and we could actually then set rules within that system that these two tables can talk to each other and see their transactions, but not those. So it's basically quite flexible depending on the system you choose. And because of this, because of the evolution of the applications out there, we have actually gone from that notion of a digital currency, Bitcoin, to different types of currencies and digital um, assets that can now be transferred. And underlying this, the tokenization of those assets, is smart contracts. So we can actually then use the smart contracts to exchange information and do transactions around any asset that can be put on a digital record. The underlying blockchain technology has evolved to support a wide range of industry applications. The first one that I really came across was the Kimberly Diamond process. This was something I worked on as a diplomat. It was a process where we tried to certify diamonds to reduce corruption and conflict payments. And in fact, um, it was fraught with corruption, duplication of certificates, false sourcing, etc. And what has evolved is a really unique system where thumbprints on the diamond actually get locked into a file and that becomes sort of an identity for the diamond and it's put in a blockchain with shared visibility by all the stakeholders across the supply chain from producers to the cutters to the bankers to the client to the insurers. It's reducing risk, it's reducing a lot of the inefficiencies and building trust. Now take that to tuna or olives or other commodities and you have the same system. Basically you can actually take a picture of your commodity, or the farmer can, or the fisher can, and it can be traced now across the supply chain as you add value to it as well. So basically, it's able to add other values, which is really unique and interesting. But so what are the advantages once we talk about land use and landscape, agriculture and forestry? Well, that's what we're here to talk about. If you think about the last use case with a commodity in agriculture, it's sort of evolving to have benefits for the various stakeholders. But really we want to talk about how does this relate to sustainable land use? What are the opportunities and challenges? And with that, without further ado, I would like to introduce Todd, who's going to give a presentation. He's using experience in the real estate industry uh, and strategic technology consulting to develop creative solutions for financial services, housing, land, registry, and supply chain organizations. He's the vice president, as I said, uh, for ChromaWay, which is an innovative blockchain software company with offices in Stockholm, Tel Aviv, Sydney, and Washington. Thank you. So, uh, can I hit to the next? Technology, Exactly. Huh? <laughs> 
Uh, where's the mouse gone? That's the main thing. You just click, um, it's not allowing us Usually to page that. that up. Yeah. Oh, oh, there we go. We can go up here. Yeah. There we there go. There we go. Good. Okay, good. So, um, um, first question is, before we talk about blockchain, I only have a few minutes here, but quickly, how many people in the room own Bitcoin? Okay. How many people in the room do, do you think your children own Bitcoin? <laughs> okay. How many of you don't know really, but you, you suspect that perhaps? Okay. Um, you know, the reason that I asked that, this is very new. Uh, I was actually a Fannie Mae for 10 years before coming into kind of the blockchain space. So, um, you know, moving from a sort of institutional type organization into kind of a startup company is a big change, but uh, we work a lot with universities and so forth, and probably like that mostly highly subscribed classes right now at universities, could be at business schools or even undergraduate, are really classes around blockchain and cryptocurrency because sort of this next generation is really enthusiastic about it. So hopefully we'll, we'll kind of catch up to where they are looking at this uh, framework and saying this makes sort of intuitive sense to me. So um, first of all, just a, a brief on, on Chromeway. We're actually based in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, we've been around since 2014 with, in the blockchain world, is we're ancient, right, uh, three years. Uh, Catherine mentioned this sort of uh, mapping between Bitcoin, which is if you look at cryptocurrencies, and we've talked a lot about assets and so forth, I think the cryptocurrency capitalization is like near $400 billion today. Bitcoin is the largest, uh, I didn't check this morning, I think it was around $7,500 or something, it's been kind of down. But it's still a large, very large market and you know continues to grow. Uh, this Bitcoin 2.0, um, the whole notion is that you could use this peer-to-peer -peer network to anchor other types of assets. And so Catherine mentioned diamonds or fish or you know land, because the idea is that you could take a digital representation, a sort of fingerprint, right, or a digital signature, and if you can track it back and forth between that physical asset and the blockchain, uh, you've got a global database that is time, date stamped, and signed, and that opens up a lot of opportunities. So um, we're working, we work a lot in around land registries, more formal registries. Frank from Cadastro is gonna talk about, uh, you know, kind of local land documentation and so forth. Uh, we work more with the uh, land registries in India and in Sweden, folks may have heard about uh, in other places. But we've also worked a lot around and around banks, around fractional investing, and we just started. I'll talk about this in a second and show you some sort of er early look at this green bonds project out of Sweden. So, um, just in terms of the platform, um, just to talk to you about, and these are uh, Catherine gave a, a beautiful overview. These are sort of the components of a blockchain platform. She talked about the database, and she talked about permissioned and non-permissioned, or private and public. We just do private or permissioned blockchains. The difference is mining, okay? Everyone is concerned, I'm sure people in the room are concerned, they think about Bitcoin, they think about the cost of electricity and mining. But what, what, what is the role of mining on the public blockchain like Bitcoin? What are they doing? Anybody know? What are they doing? Validating, exactly, they're verifying transactions, right? Because it's an untrusted network, and the way you do that is you have a bunch of these miners who are basically computer servers who are validating complex algorithms to figure out an, a to, to validate the ledger, right? So, but in a public, in a private or permission blockchain, you don't need that because you're going to permission the members to that network, right? So you've already onboarded them you know who the, you, you're gonna trust others generally to identify that, so. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is smart contracts. I don't think Catherine talked too much about that, but basically these are the idea is uh, of a Coke machine. You put in a quarter, in a, you put in a dollar in a Coke machine, there's a contract there, and plus a contract that I'm gonna get back a Coke can or a Coke bottle at the bottom, okay. The same thing with smart contracts on, um, blockchains is that if I make a contract to sell a property to Frank uh, or Anshal, uh, 
then I can execute that on the blockchain, and then we can use digital signatures to validate that. Who don't we need? We don't need them intermediaries to resolve contracts. So we're just kind of at the beginning of that process. And then tokens, and tokens are a way, tokens can be coins, they can be a new way of accounting, and I'll talk about that in, 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 the, in terms of a couple of projects. Again, um, I won't spend any time here because Catherine did such a great job, but just simplicity's sake, we can just, Think about blockchain as a network where records are managed by a central authority and are in independently added and held by every partner. We, we like to use the analogy of it's really a database, right? But instead of it controlled by one entity, uh, truth or the, uh, the actual uh, identified record is gonna be built by a consensus of partners to that database, right? Um, I'll skip this, she kind of went through it, and I'll just go, because I just have a few minutes here, to some of the applications that we're working on. Because I think maybe the best thing is to sort of uh, kind of help brainstorm what the applications would be. So in, um, in um, Sweden, we're uh, using the blockchain to develop a network, an ecosystem of buyers, sellers, banks, conveyancers around process-led transactions. So instead of uh, the registry, getting involved at the upfront process around a transfer of a property or a placing of a lien on a property. This can be done through a protocol. And actually the protocol is a contract and it looks like many other contracts, but it's issued over the network. And this is a smartphone. The idea in Sweden is that buyers and sellers will sign on with their permitted, their key. It's called a public key. It's got an associated <laughs> unique key. They'll sign the contract that way. That way, uh, they can then pass that information, can be viewed, and then can be passed on to the registry, and the registry can be confident that the contract was executed and uh, stood behind by the parties to the transaction. Um, uh, the other nice thing about the, this concept when we talk about blockchain is that the cost of the network, of the infrastructure around the network, is amortized across the partners. What do I mean by that? Um, some countries have large centralized conveyance organizations, organizations that sort of manage the uh, property transactions outside of the registry. In this case, if each partner just needs to have the protocol, it can be distributed either through a, through a smartphone or a desktop application. So there's, there's many ways we can kind of lower cost around transactions, not only for these formalized ones, but more informal ones and so forth. Uh, again, you still need to address the legal and regulatory framework. In Sweden, they don't allow e-signatures for property uh, transactions, so we had to go and sort of work around that. And then uh, we think the model is developed, that the model developed in Sweden is extensible to the developing world. We can talk about that another time. And basically, uh, this is kind of the property transfer over the blockchain. You know, you have a smartphone, people are signing out with public and private keys. This is very abstracted down. But these are those uh, nodes or the blockchain nodes that are holding the full ledger. Today, it's the land registry, it's a telecom company, it could be other neutral parties also. Um, just, have a, just have like two minutes here, but just want to talk about like fractionalized investing, because this is another application that blockchain can do because it's basically like a record keeping system, right? And if, if you can keep the records of investments, it's a lot cheaper than having Goldman Sachs do it. Uh, and because it's a ledger of, um, you could assign instead of a, uh, you know, a special purpose contract or something, you could, you could do fractionalized uh, tokenization of assets. So, there's a company called Funderbeam. It's in Estonia. It just won like the European FinTech Award. And they're using uh, blockchain backend and to assign fractional investments in startup companies, right? Same thing with this other company we're working with in Australia. They're doing that for mortgaging. And we're seeing experimentation around the blockchain for fractional investment around green investments and so forth. The key is you do need to have a flow of um, uh, concessionary or market rate return. So that I think a lot of that was sort of being discussed this morning and sort of into this afternoon is how you make them sort of projects. But again, the key thing is the infrastructure makes this sort of investment much cheaper to be able to get you know, more people sort of investing. And then uh, last one here, just green financing. Won't go into the details. This is a project based in Sweden. I think GIZ and a number of partners 
probably folks in the room are involved in this. But the key thing that we're trying to do, and, and this is um, just the, the screen here, the, uh, some of the early screenshots, is that what we're really trying to focus on the beginning are impacts, meaning that we can measure the inputs very well, the actual bonds, and the, uh, the target of those investments, but what we're trying to do is figure out how do you measure the impacts. And so we have a framework that's really built around this notion of uh, that each company or each bond issuance would have a framework. Within that framework, you're gonna have the actual uh, uh, projects, and then those projects become part of a larger pool and so forth. And then what they're gonna be doing is initially, uh, investors or bond issuers who use this are gonna be appending reports which we'll post out to the blockchain, so it'll be immutable. But we're also going to, in a second phase, talking about using like IoT sensors. So if the company's using um, uh, the, the funds to invest in scrubbers for a factory, we wanna plug in uh, these sensors to be able to report directly to the blockchain the results. So I'm sorry I ran through a lot of that. I wanna, wanna pass on and uh, Look forward to talking to you more about some of these projects. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to be saving questions to the end of the speaker panels, if that's all right, unless there's any points of uh, urgent clarification. It's a lot of information to take in, especially for those new to the space and perhaps a little bit um, general for those that are actually deep in this space, but we're trying to hit a nice balance. So I think um, what I'd like to do now, oops, we have to go through up to, to introduce Frank, uh, who's the interim CEO, uh, Programs Officer of uh, Cadesta Foundation. Thanks. All right. Good afternoon, all, and thanks for joining us. I know there's a lot you could have chosen to do this afternoon, so appreciate you deciding to come here. Um, but just by a brief way of introduction, um, Cadasta Foundation is a relatively young nonprofit based here in D.C. Um, with a focus on property rights and specifically in providing tools, technology, and technical expertise to document the rights of those left out of formal systems. Um, you know, and, and we do this on a free to use open source platform and our, our data collection tools are also open source. Our team, and myself included, uh, originally came from a background of implementing land information systems. So those kind of top-down government systems that you'd find at the national or even state level. Um, but unfortunately, you know, my experience was that, you know, despite significant investment by the donor community over the years, we're not really filling the data gap. You know, that big number of 70 to 80 percent of land remains undocumented across the world. Uh, and with this data gap, how do we all make decisions? I mean, one of the recurring themes I heard in presentations this morning was the tenure risk, the risk of insecure tenure or other property claims on property that's been acquired or um, leased for investment. And if, we, if we're strictly relying on government data, it's going to be incomplete. Um, but why do we still have this huge gap? And there, there's a couple of reasons. In, in part, it's the lack of land professionals, the surveyors, the lawyers, the notaries, or the high cost of them when they are there. Um, it's corruption in the land sector, which is, I believe, the third most sector, most corrupt sector behind the police and the judiciary, according to Transparency <laughs> International. Um, and fundamentally, a question of governance. You know, a lot of countries, the, the government's more uh, operates in the city, not the rural areas. Um, and, and land transactions are, by their very nature, a bureaucratic process. So at Cadasta, we take a different mentality. Instead of working this top-down approach that I think I'm more used to historically, it's bottom-up. We work with customary groups, NGOs, microfinance institution, local governments, um, and help them to document the rights, because in many cases, they are de facto managing the rights, even if not legally empowered to do so. Um, and also, we recognize that technology is changing the land sector. Um, it used to be we relied on the surveyor to come out and get that precise measurement. Well, the reality is that with a smartphone, we can get good enough data for most of what we need. Let's proceed along that, the, those lines. Um, and then we can incrementally improve that data on an as-needed basis. Um, let's see. So Cadasta's um, working in approximately 15 countries. Let me see if I. All right, today. 
lost a slide along the way, apologies. Um, but we're, we're working with the partners to design data collection and data management approaches. Um, and importantly, that data part is really key because we need to make sure the data is in line with expected outcomes and adheres to national or international standards. We'd like it to mature into something formal um, eventually, even if not um, currently possible under the, the regulatory environment. We want that data to be used by various organizations, which is why we really promote the idea of open data, open access, but recognizing that there's always some of that personally identifiable information in there that is not appropriate for, for public use. Um, so looking down about what are the things that can be done with, with accurate and accessible land information and even informal, um, is we've seen it. It's, it's allowing people to access finance. Um, it's giving incentives for trade and development. And critically, particularly at local government le level, it's providing that data infrastructure for planning. How are local governments going to deliver services, collect taxes, et cetera, without, um, if they're reliant on the, the national cadaster? And that's where we've seen some of our very interesting partnerships is municipalities issuing an interim type of property rights, perhaps a certificate of use, a certificate of occupancy, not the same level of security, but it's providing the data needed for that institution and the, the security for an individual to make the decisions they, they'd like to, um, uh, the long-term decisions they need to make. Um, but blockchain for land, you know, where does that fit in? And this is something that, um, um, I've been very somewhat skeptical on for a variety of reasons we'll get into, but it's clear to me from, a, from the formal side um, that there's real potential for a secure, modern system. But in emerging economies, the challenges I see aren't primarily around uh, the transparency or the security of the data. It's about the data itself. There, there simply isn't any. Um, the real challenges are, let's go out and collect the data, the first registration of property, um, going out house to house, getting information about the occupant, and then the spatial details. It's about resolving the disputes that in many countries make up, land disputes wake up, make up well over 50% of civil court cases. Um, and it's about that boundary harmonization, because inevitably as you collect spatial data, there's always going to be gaps, slivers, and overlaps, no matter what equipment you use, and that needs to be resolved. And that's where the real, uh, real expense is. So the blockchain can provide that incremental improvement, um, but what's needed is the massive first step in, for, for many of these emerging economies. Now, that said, I'm going to go back. Um, a number of blockchain, uh, blockchain advocates, including the, the folks on the panel here, have slowly been, been chipping away at me to, to, <laughs> to get me to admit there's some really interesting use cases. Um, you know, so when you think of places where there's extremely sensitive data, um, where there's a, a very much a risk of, of a foreign government overtaking the country and making off of the land registry, um, th there might be a case. And that was where Cadasta first started to do some blockchain integration with Chromeway around refugee land rights, because there's no government responsible, the sensitivity is so high, um, and it really did make a clear case. Um, with a number of other partners, you know, in all honesty, I'd say the number one request I get from partners is, can we put our data on blockchain? To which my next question is, why? And usually there's not a very compelling argument, or not even a real understanding of what it means to put it on blockchain. But it's, you know, it's up there with drones in terms of how sexy it is for a lot of organizations. Um, but it was, was Todd who, who convinced me that we, we should go that route for, for refugees. The other one we're looking at now is, is value chains. Um, and I'm beginning to see that there, there's a real aspect and potential use case that could make it more powerful. But in all honesty, I'm going to be selfish and say I look forward to hearing from you all today and to be convinced that we should be prioritizing this at Cadasta. Um, and, and integrating with blockchain, particularly around those value chain use cases. So look forward to hearing more. Thank you all. Thank you for that reality check. I think we always should start the question is not uh, where blockchain, but why or if, um, and what is the advantage over incumbent solutions? So uh, without further ado, then we move to Michelle. Oh, we've gone back There's in time. Slide. There it is. <laughs> I wondered. I thought maybe you were just trying to uh, be a little more uh, limited in your time. <laughs> Sorry about that. Do you want to? Do you want to speak? Do you want? <laughs> do you want to speak to the slide now? Um, actually, go back one. One more. Quick. Okay, if it works. <laughs> 
Um, and so this just speaks to the scarcity of land professionals. Um, so we did a quick kind of number crunching. Um, in Uganda, at, at the explicit turn approach, there were no more apparent matches after the first uh, note to the turn of the uh, uh, And just to break down the number of surveyors per 10,000 square kilometers. US, Norway, very high, but these places that have Thank you very much. So Anshel, you are the Land Administration Specialist at World Bank, and uh, you don't have slides, which is very refreshing. <laughs> it's nearing the end of our fiscal year, so I don't have slides, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no, I just, um, the idea was, before we prepared the session for you, was. Um, really to give you a sense of the opportunities that blockchain creates. Uh, it's created a lot of hype, that is true, but you know there is some, some weed to that, um, to that hype, and uh, I think uh, there are some very interesting applications. Uh, the World Bank is following this technology. We've done some proofs of value. Um, within the land sector, we've looked at uh, transfer of ownership, first registration of a parcel. Uh, we've looked at virtual authentication um, of, a, of a transaction, et cetera, because it's important for us to understand what our clients mean when they want to look at this technology. And this technology has generated a lot of interest uh, the world over. Uh, much like uh, what Frank said, I have uh, client countries that say, well, I want to be blockchain ready by 2020. Uh, and this, this is a very interesting conversation because on the one hand, you see that this technology has created so much interest that uh, people who were perhaps not looking at the importance of land rights are suddenly looking at it because this is such an important use case uh, with the asset tokenization as Catherine and, and Todd both touched upon earlier. But at the same time, you see a big gap in the enabling environment itself. And that's you know what Frank was talking about. Uh, do you have data in digital form? That's question number one. How do, you, how do you put anything on blockchain if you don't have digital data? And I work in countries where data is still in paper form. Uh, sometimes it has been written over by different uh, pens and different inks to uh, indicate transactions. Sometimes there are tears in those paper maps. Sometimes there are coffee stains on it. So that's, you know, that's the reality that we deal with. And I think this conversation of can blockchain fix this problem uh, is, is both interesting because I think the role of technology in the way at least the World Bank is looking at technology is how do we improve services? How do we improve data sharing within government organizations? How do we lower the cost uh, and the time for people to, to go ahead with those, um, those transactions? But at the same time, is blockchain the right solution? And I think that's an important question to ask because uh, what we've seen is that many countries have spent millions and millions of dollars on IT systems. Um, and some are, some are, in fact, only just finishing with these upgrades. So you've just gone through this million dollar investment in an IT system. Do you really want to throw all of that away uh, and now bring in a blockchain system when your key problem is data? So th these are some of the questions that, that have to be thought about. Having said that, blockchain is, of course, also very exciting. Uh, smart contracts that uh, the previous speakers talked about, I think, have a great potential. You will see the Dubai Land Department has done a lot of work on this. They have, uh, uh, they're piloting smart mortgages, smart escrow accounts. Uh, there's clear value in reducing risk in the market, and you see that. I think fractionalized ownership that uh, Todd was talking about is very exciting. Uh, there's also a concept of fractionalized rights, uh, so fractionalized land rights. So you see that the tokenization of assets uh, can really open up doors. I mean, think of a big high rise on a on, you know beachfront high rise in a very expensive economy. I mean, how many poor people can have access to that? today, no, but if you fractionalize rights, perhaps they can. Perhaps they can make their little dollars grow very quickly into something more meaningful. So I think this space is exciting. Another exciting area is um, 
land and gender, if you look at uh, a lot of women's land rights, what you see is that uh, the law is in place to support women uh, having property and, and in their own name. But in practice, this doesn't get done. Uh, there's a huge cultural battle, battle to fight in many countries. But if you were to say marry blockchain with uh, a web crawler that links the civil registry to the land registry, and there's a death in the family, and notice goes out three months later, we noticed person X died, uh, and you only came with the son um, to get the land right, but not the daughter. So I think there, there are things that can be automated through smart contracts. But is that the alarm going on for me to stop, or? OK, I don't know. OK. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't going over. So I think there are very exciting uh, opportunities. SolarCoin is one that you might want to look at. Uh, that actually encourages, so it's a cryptocurrency that encourages the use of solar power. So I think there's a lot of good stuff happening in this space, but going back to the implementation, I want to highlight Frank's point that really data is missing. Uh, some countries don't have digital signatures. Uh, this will be interesting. I think Todd mentioned that e-signatures were an issue in Sweden, so it would be interesting to learn how they got around that. Data accuracy, you may have digitized data, you may have blockchain data, but if the data is wrong, it doesn't matter what form that data is in. So I think data accuracy is a very important one. Um, and then I want to leave you with two more thoughts. One is around the legal and regulatory environment. Uh, as you know, innovation technology is always a few steps ahead of the lawmakers who are in charge of regulating that technology. We see this in the crypto space with uh, ICOs. Uh, I read a statistic recently that about 10% of the global initial coin offering volume comes from Russia, and about half of that is in pyramid schemes. So that's clearly something that needs to be regulated. And and I know the, I believe the Russians are looking at that. So th there's, you know, with new technology, there's new opportunities, but also areas where things could go wrong, and, and you need to think about that. So a real legal assessment is required um, with the hope that it is enabled the right kind of technology, but then also preventing the misuse of that technology by a, by a few people. Um, and the second thing is really the, the citizen aspect of it, uh, or, or it could be the farmer or the, the, the user aspect of it. And I think it's important to, to keep in mind what is this technology for? As Catherine said, why blockchain? Um, and is blockchain the right thing? Is this technology going to make this person's life better? Uh, and this is important because not only do you want to use the technology where it's most needed, because you know, donors have little money, countries have little money, and there are big, I mean, there are data gaps and there are other big challenges in addition to land rights that need to be solved. So there's, um, uh, you know, f few, uh, there are few funds chasing very big projects, uh, and not everything is going to get done. So we have to prioritize and we have to realize, okay, if this is going to make someone's life better, then yes, let's try it, let's pilot it, let's try a prototype, et cetera. But the citizen aspect is so important because if the people don't understand the technology, it's not going to go anywhere. Uh, my parents still don't book flights online because they, they don't trust their credit cards or the online system. And um, so, you know, you have to get a certain level of comfort with the technology, especially a new technology where you can spend hours and hours learning and not figure out what a hash is or blah, blah, blah. So there's so much to learn in this technology. What is the citizen level of comfort? And the flip side of that is, what if something goes wrong? Does the government have a mechanism in place that you could pick up a phone line uh, or send an email to someone and, and know that they will respond to you? So I think with, with the technology, these are some very important aspects to keep in mind. Uh, it's one thing if you know you get an alert that somebody used your card in Alaska and you know we've blocked it and then you know who to call, but it's quite something else if you lose money from your Bitcoin wallet, there's nobody to call. Uh, so you know, just some things to keep in mind. And with that, I will hand it back to Catherine, who has a very interesting uh, case study lined up for you. Thank you very much. Uh, before we launch into that, I want to uh, enable some discussion, too. So um, if anyone has questions, we will take time for that right now. I think what I'm hearing from all three is really interesting sort of dilemma that we're sort of, there's a lot of discussion about the fourth revolution right now. Um, but are we actually building additionality to silos and to um, the haves and the haves nots? So what do, what, are the key essential elements here. We're talking about data, we're talking about access and trust in a very different way. And I would just like to comment on that before we take other questions. So, 
Anyone? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with, uh, I, I guess like Catherine and I are on the go blockchain and Frank and uh, uh, Unsell are on the let's hold up. Actually, it's, it's a healthy debate because, I mean, I don't think we could have anticipated probably 15 years ago the discussions we're having now about privacy and data security. So it's really important without understanding the underlying technology. Uh, you don't need to understand that to know what are the implications of it. Uh, you know, I, I think what's, what's sort of interesting to me what's happening is let's put aside the fact that, you, you know, it's not like a black magic, you know, proof a distributed database that does it, or that um, is not controlled by anyone, I think. You know, it's funny when we go and we talk to, because we also get, get a lot of calls from formal land we want blockchain. And then we get there and we say, okay, great, because we're going to take the uh, registry and we're going to put it out on the blockchain, on a permission blockchain, but it's going to be open. They say, well, we don't want that kind of blockchain, right? Because, you know, what we're, we need to kind of think about is the disintermediary implications of that. You know? Because the exciting thing for me is also a little scary in the fact that uh, what, what Bitcoin has done and what these other ICOs, what they're really trying to figure out here is there an alternative economic or business model that creates capital both as a store of value but also as a business model, right? So do I need to go to uh, an investment bank to be able to raise funds? Uh, now, there's some concerns that the SEC has about that. But on the positive side, as we get through some of these things, the this sort of framework Frank, do you have anything to sure, I might just add, add one point to your uh, I think data access and trust, and that, that's about the that's about the the data standards um, and the the metadata or the data about the data. Because so when when speaking of property rights information, particularly spatial information, we need to know who collected it, when, how accurate, um, so it can be applied in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. The phrase "garbage in, garbage out" is is predominant in this space, and this is really something we we adhere to. Angel, anything to add? Uh, just two quick points. One, the SEC put on a fake website yeah. for ICOs, and it was like sold out in a few hours. Uh, they, they wanted to prove that this is uh, yeah. this could go very wrong. But the other thing is, I don't. I wouldn't want to say let's hold up. I don't think that's what. Um, I don't. I don't know if I speak for Frank, but definitely not my approach. I think the approach is let's pilot. Uh, let's check this technology in lab conditions, uh, and let's bring different people together. Mm -hmm. What often happens is that uh, this ends up being a technology conversation, and it is not only a technology conversation. You need economists in the room, you need lawyers, you need civil rights activists, you need, uh, I mean, you need citizens, you need so many people in this room to have this conversation. Uh, what is happening often is that this is being discussed in closed rooms, uh, without looking at you know some of the data problems and and all of that, so I think there's a need to create that awareness. Uh, and you know, one analogy I use is you don't need to understand exactly how a microwave works to use it, but you need to know the basics. You need to know not to touch it with wet hands. You need to know not to throw metal in it. That's the kind of conversation I'm talking about. So I think without this, you wouldn't get to the solutions that I think even um, you know the the big people who are pushing this are looking for. Absolutely. I would echo some of that. Um, and uh, I'm not as much a gung-ho on blockchain as it may seem. In fact, my organization that I, I co-founded, which I've recused myself from for the moment, is about open collaboration. And the first question we ask is if and why. And in fact, um, we have actually not entered the ICO space at all because we want to use any tokens for reinvestment certificates. So the only tokens that we've actually been looking at are the ones that actually have value as the data is um, 
generated. So for example, with solar, as the energy is generated, the certificates gets uh, created, and then it is burned as it is um, brought back in for reinvestment. So even though it's a local peer-to-peer -peer system, we're then actually looking to integrate that also into the carbon markets and to the financial inclusion. So the last question I have is about those type of business models. And Todd, you had sort of um, started the discussion in that area, and I wonder if you have some something further to say on that. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I mean, just to your comment in about yourself, I'll just go straight to you. I mean, if, if folks recall COVID, uh, you know, 19, uh, we're probably in the same area. I will say that, you know, there are a lot of uh, you know, very smart, I mean, Positive way, people really trying to kind of think about some of the fundamental problems that we have. Why? I mean, I think Catherine mentioned at the beginning, like when 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 did Bitcoin come out? Like in 2008. What happened in 2008? We had a financial meltdown. So there was a there was certainly sort of a breakdown in trust in a lot of traditional entities and government and financial institutions. So what? A mixture of both uh, interest, you know, interest, greed, and innovation is kind of happening right now. People are trying to push the boundaries of what are new, what are these sort of new economic and technical models that can get us out of some of those risks that you know, we're seeing right now. Any questions from? Yes, lots. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. I really appreciated learning about the applicability for land tenure. Um, but I wanted to know a little bit more about the applicability for agricultural value chains. You started a little bit, and I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on how, uh, what are some of the uses? For example, the ones that I was thinking about were um, traceability and certifications and, and uh, food safety traceability. And so, um, yeah, just I'd love to, to hear a little Absolutely. bit more about that. Well, if you're staying for the whole session, you'll actually be able to participate in answering that question yourself. So um, if you want, we're going to actually do a little exercise around the coffee value chain. Um, but to, to answer it, basically, it, it, it's exactly the issues that you discussed. Um, it's really about bringing in the right stakeholders, bringing in the right data, as all of this is. And that data could be existing certification methods or we can actually start adding the Internet of Things where things are scanned automatically. Um, and it's all about entering that data into a system and then sharing it with the stakeholders and the network itself, making sure it's immutable. But then it's about what's the next step. A lot of these value chain approaches are very linear right now. And it's all been about sort of the consumer uh, making sure I can trace that this is actually bioorganic um, grown by so-and-so in this region. Well. Let's layer that up, I think, is really the question that we want to ask. And, and we're going to do a little use case to, to map out the first stage of that. But first, if you don't mind, I'd like to go to the next question before we jump into that. Yes? I think I haven't uh, really fully understood uh, how it works. So the, here is a very basic question. Um, if I trust in a blockchain, wouldn't I need to trust the very initial transaction? Because what does it help me if a lot of people um, in the blockchain where this is going around in the network also don't know what has been done in the beginning? Why would that give me more trust? If I don't know what happens in the beginning, who is certifying that diamond in which way or who is actually gathering the data um, for the land titles. Mm -hmm. If I don't have that piece of information, I don't trust that piece of information, why would I put more trust into it if it goes through uh, a chain of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people? Mm -hmm. And this is yeah. um, a question about stakeholders and the, the yeah. asset I mean, itself. I just respond to that brief by saying I mean, the idea behind a blockchain is to be able to take that information. So, you know, I guess I'd ask you a question about you know, why do you trust the bank here? Bitcoin. 
find there's 6,000 validating instances, right? For permission blockchain, there's only 100. But every time a transaction is passed through the blockchain, each node is interrogating the entire ledger to find how many of those are true. Again, if I sell a piece of property to you, and we both sign it with a digital signature that has been validated, then somebody can check to see, was my key Todd Miller, and was your key, what's your first name? Robert. Was that Robert's key? We can go back and validate that. We'll talk after. I think we'll need more than three minutes to this. I saw you wanted to say something on that. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And as I mentioned, we did some proofs of value at the World Bank, and we did first registration of a parcel instead of a normal registration. And the reason was because we didn't have the history. Uh, so we did first registration going in for the first time. And I think this is, uh, this is exactly the points that Frank and I were making. You know, is the data complete? Is the data accurate? How do you trust that? And I think what's very interesting is that Todd's work in Sweden when it comes to the, to the transactions. When I first heard that Sweden was doing a blockchain pilot, I, and I was like, what trust problem does Sweden have? You know, so it's, it's just very interesting when, when you see that, um, you know, countries that are ranked very highly by Transparency International are also using blockchain. It's, it's a bit like a willingness to pay um, for the incremental benefit of security, et cetera, et cetera. I think Todd can speak more to that, but I think those are very interesting questions. And uh, partly why the enabling environment would need to include, you know, com completeness of data records and accuracy of those records. Not to mention the stakeholders that you, I mean, some of these blockchains actually begin with the trusted stakeholders in your value chain to begin with. That's not always the case, but that is one scenario. So it is a longer and lengthier discussion that we need to have, I think. Is there any final burning question before we jump into an exercise? <laughs> oh, how about we give it to this gentleman? He, he's been waiting patiently. <laughs> Uh, yes, absolutely. And I think maybe there are two types of trust here at play. There's the on-chain trust, uh, which is whatever is happening on the blockchain with the technology and the uh, either multiple validators on a uh, public blockchain or the pre-assigned, pre-authorized validators on a private blockchain. Them validating the transaction uh, through this consensus mechanism is one way of creating trust. But the other trust you're talking about is the off-chain trust, the trust in the records and the government and that you know if something goes wrong, you can call someone and they can fix your problem. So you're absolutely right. I would put that in more of the enabling environment. Um, if a blockchain solution is to work and it is to be scalable beyond a simple pilot here or there, I think those are very important um, questions to, to address. And I agree with that. I would say, and this is Robert's question also, is that uh, you, you need to evaluate blockchain not on a policy relative to the decisions we have to make. So, uh, you know, I agree with all the pitfalls and regulations and so forth, but, you know, and again, I'm going to lose to Wells Fargo here, but, I mean, that's a perfect example of a centralized system where, where you know, where I guess uh, the only thing I would ask is evaluate it not relative to a perfect world, but to the world we're in today. And then we may look over time. Mm, thank you very much. Uh, well, I want to give a round of applause. You have one more thing to say? Yes, go ahead.
So this is perhaps my burning comment. I think um, you touched upon IoT, Internet of Things, and I think one um, area where blockchain could make a huge difference is if you marry blockchain with Internet of Things and you start tracking some of the sustainable development goals, like carbon emissions, et cetera, I think that's an area where uh, it, it can be piloted and it can be tested. And I think that has a direct relevance to not only the topic today, but some of the biggest challenges that we're dealing with in the world. Absolutely. That's actually something I'm working directly on, so I'm happy to have that discussion with you afterwards, both in terms of carbon and other assets. And uh, that actually segues beautifully into what we're here to do. Um, and uh, we are four, three panelists. I first want to give a nice round of applause for their presentations <laughs> and discussion. We're going to keep them here and hopefully have a wrap-up uh, Q&A at the end of our exercise because I think we're just going to have more robust discussions once we all dig in a bit. Um, we were supposed to go to 3 o'clock, if that clock is correct. Um, and we started 15 minutes late, so we're actually doing quite well. So I had foreseen maybe 20 minutes to do this exercise, but we'll, we're, we will curtail it a bit um, to just do one question. And I think it goes to some of the questions that you've had and some of the issues we've addressed here. Because when you first and foremost, as an entity, whether you are a producer, whether you are a government, um, you need to ask not you know, where blockchain and how, but why. Um, and so some of the issues that you were raising, Todd, and um, all, actually all of you, uh, relate to whether blockchain, you know, what should we do? Why should we do it? How should we do it? Um, and if you look at the, the question I always ask is, what are the key inefficiencies that you're trying to address? And why aren't they being addressed by your incumbent solution? Is it better just keep building with those, with the technology that you've just invented, invested $10 million in? Or is there something we can do here that might make it more accessible, more fast, um, and easier? That, that's basically the key questions you ask first and foremost. And the key characteristics, the first and key problems or inefficiencies, uh, operational cost, uh, contracts and execution, customer service and experience, that's not so much what we're doing here, but that can be also about business modeling, uh, risk management, management, transparency and fraud, and data should be in there as well. You know, what data do you have available? And is there an issue? Can we actually um, make data more automatic directly from sensors and meters rather than from spreadsheets if it's available? And then the key characteristics, match that against the key characteristics of blockchain systems themselves. The underlying asset that you're trying to transact on, is it property? Contracts? Is it land rights? Is it a commodity? Uh, is it an identity? How are you going to establish that that data is verified is first and foremost the question you ask because that's what you're putting into a blockchain. The underlying stakeholders and parties, as you were saying, you know, if we're just going to throw something out into the Bitcoin space, then the whole world is going to be able to interact. But usually we say, let's start small, build with your stakeholders that you have in place that you do have initial trust or transactions with, or you don't trust and you have transactions with, um, and you go from there. And then those actual transactions, what is it you're trying to transact? Everyone's jumping onto the currency side of things, but in fact, I usually say, keep your payments offline Figure out what you're actually trying to transact first and foremost. Are you transacting the land rights? Are you transacting the commodity? Are you transacting the value of the human labor that's going into that commodity? That's something you can actually do. But whether you unlock the fiat payment through blockchain or you add a currency onto that, that should be a secondary question, I think. Maybe others disagree with me. And then the database of records. What are you trying to store, or not store, but what are you trying to transact, and where and what um, data will you be using? So given that, we wanted to bring this down to a very basic level and focus largely on establishing that initial step of, OK, we've identified, let's identify a problem, a use case. And we've decided to use coffee. Uh, we all discussed it and agreed that uh, this would be a really useful approach because um, coffee is a complex production and supply chain system problem. Uh, there's un increasing uncertainty and unfairness and countless middlemen. One in 60 people in the globe rely on the coffee supply chain for their livelihood. Um, and coffee farmers only receive 2% of the added value of every cup. And something I threw in here, because it goes to a little surprise at the end, 
is that 99% of roasting is done outside the country of origin. So that whole business model and value chain is something we will end with in terms of the discussion. So this was the general problem. We're not going to solve it in 15 minutes. Um, but we can talk about a specific case. So we're going to zoom in on Ethiopia, which has the fifth largest coffee producer, um, which is the fifth largest coffee producer in the world. 95% uh, of that is produced by small farmers. And there have been two uh, approaches, basically, to try and improve the situation. One was the intensification of production, um, bundling of lands into large plots. Unfortunately, a lot of that went to foreign investors and certification to guarantee a better price. Um, neither has resulted in increases to overall profits nor benefits to the local farmers and producers. Certification has been a huge problem, so we're sort of going to focus a bit on that level. Uh, it has been fraught with challenges, including definition and criteria, traceability, quality, and it means that special buyers are the ones winning out anyway. So we want to say, let's go in and focus on one case of coffee. And we're going to use, I'll let, I'll bring you into that discussion. Um, so, actually going back here, what we have here, we four and others are going to, sorry, uh, would you like to introduce yourselves? Because yeah. we have uh, GL, uh, GLF and C4 people here to help us with this session. We're each going to be circulating to the tables. Of, sorry, I'm terrible with names. Uh, to the tables to help you through the session. And basically, there is a very lengthy handout. You probably don't need it because I'll leave the Zoom Ethiopia uh, stats up here. But you'll have this spreadsheet and this. Well, not a spreadsheet. We're only going to focus on the first question, basically. And the problem is, it's a, looking at this discussion guide, what we just discussed, uh, we're going to use the que a, a specific question in case. Numerous companies and organizations built out pilots and are exploring blockchain in the food and agriculture supply chains. Um, using blockchain and supply chains offers a lot of these capacities. And uh, we need to reduce the friction and the administrative cost. That was the proposal we put together. We've broken it down now to the coffee chain. And what we want to say is in order for any blockchain to start, you need to identify your key stakeholders. Who do you want in your network, in your blockchain? So that's basically the first question. I have uh, more sheets here. Please just work in teams of four or five. Go to the next table if you can. Um, and the first question is, blockchains are decentralized networks that require a consortium of initial partners. List four or five partners or stakeholders that you, can, that you would include um, if you were to start building blockchain in this space. And that would be required to build this project. Alternatively, insert the network partners nodes on the little drawing here. So I've already created a little network here. So, that's all we want to do is discuss that for maybe five minutes, discuss who the partners are, try lightning, uh, very speed inputs. There's no no's here, just yes. And map out whether it's bottom end or top end of the value chain and map out who you think the top four or five partners would be. What we'll do is come back with lightning round. Each table say which partner or stakeholder they thought should be in the blockchain to see if we map them all out. So I'll give you five minutes to do that, and we will all circulate around to help. I hate to interrupt. I hear some great discussions happening, and I don't think anyone's going to be able to answer the question or wants to answer the question the way it's been portrayed. So what I'd like is you could wrap it up in one minute, please. Everyone's hit the same. 
I can walk in this valley chain, it sucks. <laughs> All right, I think we are going to come back. We want to hear what each of you is actually focused on because what happened with this exercise is what happens when we bring the technologist into a situation and we say, let's put this all in a blockchain. It actually starts this type of discussion says, well, actually the value chain is kind of broken. <laughs> um, there's some big inefficiencies and there's big issues with the stakeholders. So did anyone actually come up with an actual value chain and stakeholder group that they would want to bring together? All right, so can we just go from table to table? First, those that actually did map something out, just very brief one, uh, you know, one minute response. And then those that came up with new business models uh, which I did hear a lot about, or if you just answered the questions as they are, I'd love to hear that. But we're just going to go very quickly from table to table. Key points, please. So. I'm not sure I can capture it all in one minute. Yeah, so David here is the chief visionary officer and founder of M2E, which I'm wearing his brand here. And, uh, and rather than build a, a blockchain from the ground up, we actually are building a presentation layer on top of the Stellar blockchain, the Stellar platform. And Stellar was designed for, you know, basically to deploy financial infrastructure to undeveloped parts of the world. So it's a lot easier instead of cobbling the whole thing together and, you know, figuring out from low level to just, you know, to, to build apps on top of an existing blockchain that was designed for financial infrastructure. And so I don't have enough time to go into it, but we have designed a, a full-blown what we call an agribusiness for Africa that includes a micro-lending platform where we're attracting a lot of crypto. A lot of people have half a trillion dollars worth of cryptos laying around. People don't want to cash out. They're looking for new investments. There's also a new blockchain lending market that's popping up based on smart contracts where instead of liquidating your crypto, you can put it in a smart contract and borrow against it. So we're trying to build a sort of a massive crowdfunding platform for Africa that'll pour wealth into it. And we also are dealing with the off-take side. We're building a marketplace where African products will be available there and we're connecting into a lot of other big buyers, but that's my one minute. So. Beautiful. Yeah, anything to add? I need just one more adjunct to this because uh, we're here with our partner, the African Union. He represents uh, Elvis here, uh, represents the um, Great Green Wall, which has now been extended to 35 countries in Africa. So that's very substantial. So the concept of an agro blockchain is over 34 countries in Africa. And each, the name of our company is Meter Squared Earth, M2E. So that's why we're calling it that, because each square meter we're believing has a value. And we can talk specifically about the value of each square meter. But we answered, uh, we answered that, but now you can go on you around the room. business model altogether. But anybody who wants to, to talk about it, just come on over and we'll talk about it when right. we're finished, okay? All right. Um, how about the table at the back? Because you also, no? <laughs> you also discussed the business model itself, right? Actually, I, I, I don't know whether we answered any questions. We, we, so you raised some good points. We just ended up having an argument. Um, I, um, we, we sort of started off by saying, oh yeah, let's, let's just go with the, the actors in, in, the block, in the supply chain itself. And then we had a bit of a disagreement about whether or not we include traders, mm -hmm. whether we like traders, whether we don't like traders. <laughs> and. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about, you know, whether they had any value um, and should they be included. And, and I, um, we had some examples where where uh, traders themselves just, you know, provide very little but take a lot. Um, whereas I, I was of the opinion, and, and some of the others are of the opinion that actually we, they should be included because they play quite a quite a critical role in local supply chains um, to processing. So. Um, there was, I think where we sort of concluded was, um, do you build on the existing supply chain or do you try and build an alternative supply chain around it? And, and, or, and then do you give, you, you give people the choice at least of whether they want to be operating in the system that existed or whether they want to be, um, you know, a, w working on, on a whole new kind of supply chain. I, I think I'm summarizing this um, terribly badly. No, very well. But, uh, <laughs> Um, 
Yeah, I think that that was kind of what Great. we... Yeah, add, mm -hmm. definitely. <laughs> Part of our discussion, which wasn't really an argument, but a very interesting discussion, was to what extent is this apparatus relevant in places where the fundamental problem with the supply chain is, or the value chain, is uh, asymmetries of information. Mm -hmm. The fact that um, the information doesn't flow, that there are blocks, um, and the, the way to correct that is to have a better flow of information. If you don't have the information flows to start with, does that mean you don't have the digitized data that you can actually put into a system that would help a, a blockchain apparatus um, resolve that? So that was a basic question that we had, and we spent a lot of time talking about it. Okay, thank you. Um, very quickly then, let's move to the next table, see if you actually mapped out something or just discuss the issues and problems in the value chain itself. Uh, yeah, so I think we, uh, we all kind of came to a consensus that we should have a uh, coffee roaster, something like La Colombe. Uh, that would be one end, and then on the other end, you would have a smallholder farmer. Okay. And so then I think the most of our discussion focused similarly on what would be the in-between space. And so, you know, for us, I think uh, a certification and verification of uh, outcomes or, you know, the, the standards that are used in the, in the agricultural system is important and then also uh, some type of government regulation to uh, oversee the import and export process. Uh, beyond that, I think, you know, we do, I think, acknowledge that land tenure rights are an issue. Um, mm -hmm. Beyond that, I think we had hoped that uh, the blockchain system would cut out a distributor, but I think, you know, none of us really have a, enough of an understanding <laughs> to really say that that's possible at this point. Okay. Thank you very much. Next table. Anyone? You don't have to respond, but please let's, well, I'm very conscious of the time here. I want to make use of it. So please, if you do have uh, some interesting points, please raise them. Well, yeah. I don't know if this was intentional or not, but we took a very, um, a, a, rather than having a debate about, I think we just assumed that the, um, the data, tri the data pro that the blockchain that we were developing was specifically going to address the data gap like that, the, its function, the reason for starting it would be to say, okay, well, there's a, a real problem with data asymmetries in the system, and that, in fact, um, if there are trader bad actors, we have to have them in the system because the only way to force them to um, ha pay fair prices and then for us to validate that they are, in fact, acting, um, you know, well, is to have them in the system. Otherwise, there's a whole black uh, box of bad coffee transactions going on that aren't being blockchain that aren't in, uh, transparent to everybody in the in the network. So our um, network of value chain actors of that we need to include in order to launch a coffee blockchain project about traceability includes everybody who ever touches the coffee before <laughs> between the person who grows it and the people who drink it um, uh, or the people who sell it to the people who drink it. Um, and, uh, and then they're hopefully providing some information to those people also about like how much do, did the farmer get paid? Um, how much did the trader take? Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's the way that then I think that the blockchain works to transform the system to one that equalizes those information asymmetries, which translate into corrupt practices yes. um, and you know, uh, economic asymmetries. Great. So it's not just about bringing in the stakeholders. We just did a little Good mapping actors. here. You And actors, you have to actually have the data flows there and the verification certification process as well. Any, anyone else? Yes, please. Yeah, we, we had a, a good discussion also. We also sort of mapped all the, the people in the value chain, but didn't really discuss that so much, how to change that. I think the, the main discussion was around how do you link the consumer with the producer through the bean, the individual bean, and that kind of DNA, that tag. And there was a short discussion, but it stopped very quickly because we don't have a lot of information on this. But basically figuring out if you can expand on soil infrared spectrography and the signals that it creates. Is there anything in the soil, anything in the bean that is picked up from the soil? Because you want to know the location and the person of that piece of land where that bean is created and how you can possibly trace it. And if there's enough people and the right technology that are willing to participate, they buy these little units to then crush a bean and figure out where it comes from. Now you have all kinds of other problems with beans mixing in one cup and um, a whole bunch of other things. And one thing that just came to mind that we didn't discuss here is when you remove that asymmetry of information can really have horrible 
results. I don't know how many of these smallholder farmers in Ethiopia know what people pay for a cup of coffee here in DC and what would it do to, to, to them. Uh, and it, it, yeah, it, it makes me think of a documentary I saw about people in China making Mardi Gras beats and then someone went back to show them movies of, of New Orleans to show them what, what, how those beats are, are acquired and, and they were just absolutely horrified of, of course. Mm -hmm. All right. So was there any table else that wanted to participate and tell us? Yes, please. Yeah, so I think we arrived a little bit at the same conclusion that, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but um, that in fact we would probably map out a lot of the stakeholders in the supply chain. We had an interesting discussion around the middlemen and the traders and whether actually the use of blockchain would be um, a threat to, to traders. Um, and right at the beginning of our conversation, we were also thinking about why would we do this in the first place? I think it's coming back to the question that you were saying about whether or if, you know, blockchain. And I think the thing that seemed appealing was around the traceability, although we see also a lot of challenges around that. And I think what would be nice in a way is if you would know when you drink your coffee and then you could see, I don't know how, what actually like, you know, is coming from there. So there's also the, the kind of increasing the linkage between the end consumer and mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any final comment? Yes, at the back. Um, not a summary of our discussion, but just some thoughts about hearing everyone, <clears throat> excuse me, everyone speaking. I guess it, it, what I see is that um, like the, the challenges in creating traceability in this value chain are about reorganizing the supply chain and how it's organized and bringing formality um, basically tracing it back through the traders to the producers. And I, I didn't, what didn't come out for me is how blockchain makes any of that easier or more simple. Like all of this are really challenging organizational problems that we should address uh, whether or not blockchain is coming in. But I, I, didn't, I didn't see how blockchain made it easier. Absolutely. Um, I mean, this is the, the big challenge we face in this space. And actually, what we find is this type of discussion is what actually happens in the first place. And that is really good, because it really is about asking those questions. And it draws out the fact that, yes, you can actually, this is the IBM demo on blockchain. It basically went back and just sort of mapped out the people in a blockchain to allow for traceability for the consumer to know where the coffee came from. Um, they can trace the lineage of a shipment of coffee beans and therefore the quant quality of the beans if you trust everyone in that system going back. It doesn't address any of the issues that you've discussed, does it? And it's a very linear approach and a very complex value chain and a very complex ecosystem. And addressing the broader goal, the ecosystem, the business model and the land rights issues really isn't a part of this. So. Um, one thing I wanted to leave you with uh, before we go back to the final discussion is saying, you know, these questions about the certification, the data, the traceability, the IoT, who's, which stakeholders do you bring in or perhaps replace or move um, is actually something that does happen in this space and that we're trying to, to work on. So this type of discussion is absolutely essential. The business model and system not only gives um, the, the we have to examine those to give the stakeholders, the farmers, the roasters and consumers, you know, access to the data and access to each other. That's, the, that's how this is happening um, in a way. It brings them together once they agree to participate. And so I wanted to give you um, a suggestion of Moyi Fairchain. Moyi was one of the startups that came to me in Climate Kick and Anshel actually had suggested them as a case study, so it was like magic. Um, they actually started just off, offline, off blockchain, um, a certifying uh, coffee business, grower to coffee shops in Ireland, and now I think it's again Amsterdam. And basically, the big thing they did before they even went to the blockchain was to start roasting the coffee themselves in the country of origin. That started shifting things already in terms of the business model. They started a 50-50 partnership with the local growers, and then they started going to the blockchain. So they actually already had started working on the, the model, the value chain itself. And they brought in what they call a robot, which I think is a very unfortunate term, um, that basically integrates um, the blockchain IoT. And I think it's a really good place to end this exercise because it, 
it's just a sort of small way, along with all of the other proposals out here, that we can see a way forward if, if we do this right, if we have the right discussions. Um, and they brought in this robot that basically ships, uh, sifts and sorts the coffee. So they, they come in with their bundles. Uh, they empty in this hopper, basically, which sifts and sorts the coffee cherries, automatically analyzes and assigns a grade, and therefore the price. It generates an agreement to sell automatically, uh, attaches a price to the actual cherry, um, and the digital payments to the farmer, to the co-op, and even pays the taxes. There's immediate feedback on the harvest on top of it. And therefore, it's not just about transparent tracking across the value chain. It's about shifting things around. If we have time, I do have um, the video ready to go. I just don't. We're out of time? OK. But I really recommend you looking at it. Yes? Anshel wanted to, we're going to wrap up. We started 15 minutes late, so. Yeah, but yeah, we were. Okay. We also were 15 minutes into our session when they left. So just one more comment from Anshel, Yeah, I just please. wanted to add uh, that uh, Moy Coffee has been able to add 20% more yes. money going into the farmers' pockets uh, because of this value chain um, that they've done. And as Catherine mentioned, it's not entirely because of blockchain, but I think it's uh, an interesting way of how they're disrupting the the chain itself, uh, and then of course adding technology on top to help the farmers. Well, <laughs> so this is just uh, the hopper and maze. I want to thank you very much for the participants and to the speakers.